awesome. We are live. Happy Friday, everyone. Uh, good morning. Welcome to Board Gaming Breakfast. Uh, I think I'll wait to give a few people a chance to jump into the call, but uh, I'll give a quick overview of Board Gaming Breakfast is a weekly live stream that I like to do every weekday morning where I'll go live for 30 minutes and kind of start the day off with some fun creativity in the board game space. So how Board Gaming Breakfast generally works is I will bring a game to the table that I really want to talk about for mechanical type reasons or a game that I've been really enjoying. And after we kind of give a quick, quick overview of what that game is and what mechanics are my favorite in it and why I've enjoyed my plays of the game, we'll move into spinning the wheel of mechanics which will randomly generate a wheel for or a mechanic for us from the wheel that we'll have to add into the game of the day and then we'll finish off this board gaming breakfast with a five minute brainstorm designing blitz where we'll get prompted with a random game prompt and we will have five minutes to figure out how to create a game off of it so with that intro i'm actually going to change things up today with normally i bring a published game to the table from our shelves behind us and we talk about that but i'd actually like to talk about the game i've been working on everstone and so let me set things up here where it should be captured soon There we go. So, welcome to the world of Everstone. So, for you, oh, those of you who haven't seen the game I've been working on, Everstone is based on this fantasy uh, sci-fi world that we've been building behind the scenes. And the main core concept of the game is that you're working to navigate through Everstone with your caravan player board, and you're racing to be the to get up this legendary point track up here. And so I'm not gonna do a full in-depth overview of what the game is today, but I'm going to talk about some of the mechanics that have made it very fun to play during development uh, that get me excited to play Everstone whenever I have the chance. So I have laid out in front of me the player board and some of the relic cards. Those are gonna be the two main focuses that I'm going to be highlighting in today's board game and breakfast. We'll start with the relic cards. So if we come up into here, uh, these are just prototype mock-ups. Uh, I'd like to preface off, but this card over here shows what the card backs of each look like. And we have three in front of here, which show the card front. And so the basic user interface of the card is this will be the cost to restore this relic into working condition. And one of my favorite parts in Everstone is that once you've restored the relic to uh, be able to work again, you have to make a decision. And so in this white bounding box here is a reward you can gain immediately right away. And on the bottoms, you can see these different colored sections. That is sort of a delayed gratification option where you can put it under one of your action slots on your player board to get that reward over time when you take that action. So. I find this to be such a, or a fun, uh, again, I'm biased because I'm the designer of it, but I find this decision space to be really fun because you have to plan out whether you're just looking to profit off of it sh short term and sending it into the discard, or if you decide, hey, that's, that's an action I'd like to build my strategy around to keep building towards, where once you've paid for the upgrade cost of it, it will move into the action slot that it has been, or under the action slot it was stored in. So if we had it in our travel space, it would go under your player board. And then for the rest of the game, whenever you take that travel action, later after you complete the full action, you'd have the opportunity to keep bonus benefiting off of that relic card. And so it gives this fun balance of what you're looking to use immediately versus what you're looking to benefit for over time, which I find to be extremely cool. The other aspect of 
the puzzle of using and gaining these relic cards that I really like is I glossed over it in the explanation of what the, how the cards are set up, but when you're getting cards from the market, uh, you'll have to carry them in your storage. And while they're in your storage, they're not working because you found these relics that are sort of broken and beat up and kind of left and outcasted throughout Everstone. And the resource cost are like the materials that you need to fix them up to working condition. So there's two parts of this adding into your storage uh, decision space that I really enjoy have enjoyed during the development process. The first is deciding where what which of the four spaces you'd like to hold the relics in, because not only are you covering up a potential storage benefit that you can gain whenever taking that action, but you also have to think about if you're looking to store and upgrade this relic long term where you want to place that upgrade because when you have taken the produce action and you get to pay the cost and upgrade the relic uh, it, it's not that it can go under any action slot it has to slide down into the action slot where you placed it before so if in that example we were talking about a few seconds ago if we wanted it upgraded under our travel action we'd have to store it there before uh, we ended up producing that card. And so this fun puzzle of figuring out which, when's the right time to cover up the bonus because you're not looking to take the travel action anytime soon and trying to plan long-term about building a fun upgrade engine because as the game progresses and you upgrade more and more cards, you'll create this action sequence that is very rewarding. So for this example, if we had placed over time gotten all three of those cards upgraded under the travel action not only would we get to travel and take the returning to base camp action on this turn but that storage space is open so we get an added benefit to that main action and then we get to uh, choose to place an influence to upgrade a card from the market we get to charge cards and then if our storage is empty we'd also get to harvest and so this uh, this whole puzzling sequence of figuring out where to store cards and where to upgrading them to is a puzzle that I'm, again, I'm biased, but I've been really enjoying during this development process. The last mechanic that I'd like to talk about today, and there's probably a half a dozen others that I'd like to highlight at some point, is the back of these relic cards. And so as you can see, each back is slightly different from one another. And that's because when you take this prospect harvest action here, oh, one second, when you take this prof prospect action, the base action of it is rolling the three dice and then choosing two to figure out which track on the influence track you're going to go up and the remaining die being the, seat, the number of resources that you get from it. That's being the main mechanic of how you'll gain these raw resources to restore the relics. Uh, if at any time you are able to manipulate the dice, so like for this example, on this roll, we have the 5, 6, and 4, which are matching the back of this card. If this card was on the top of the market deck, we'd have the option to forego gaining any resources or gaining any influence and choose to instead gain this mystery card from the top of the deck. And there's two benefits that you would get from choosing the top card of the deck. The first being that you would get the you would discover this relic in working condition. So you get to ignore having to pay any of the cost and bring it into your storage. And you may choose to either claim that one time bonus right now or slot it immediately into any upgrade in your under your player board. And so again it you're faced with this uh, decision of do I give up what is known because with rolling the dice you know what track you get to move up and you know how many resources you get uh, for the potential upside of gaining something way better in the sense of because you don't have to follow this normal sequence of getting the card from the market and bring it into your storage and restoring it so it can work it speeds up all of that uh, action cycle so that you get to take advantage of it right now and so there is the randomness of not knowing what you're going to get but that uh, 
that fun of like, ooh, like it could, it could work, it could work. Ah, I'm gonna go for it. Is that decision that you can always have the possibility of being presented every time you take the prospect action to roll the dice. And so, I could probably go on for the rest of uh, the stream talking about Everstone, but I'm going to uh, take a pause on it there and move into the next segment of our uh, breakfast. And so to recap, Everstone, the game I've been working on, is our game of the day. And we talked a lot about the relic cards and how they interface with your storage board and the, the decision space around that that makes me really enjoy any time I get to be part of a playtest. So for those of you who are entering the board game breakfast for the first time, the next segment we're going into is we have our wheel of mechanics. And so what'll happen is we'll spin this wheel and whatever it lands on will be the mechanic that we have to brainstorm adding it to the game of the day. And so we got hidden, uh, or hidden rolls. All right, hidden rolls. I'm gonna write that where it can be seen by everyone so it's not hidden. So we got hidden rolls as our mechanic that we're brainstorming around today. Oop. There we go. And so what we'll do now is we'll take our phone out and give us a five minute timer and brainstorm how we might be able to ha add in hidden rolls to Everstone. So with that, we have started our timer. And so the only piece of hidden information in Everstone, I'll jump back into the game setup, is that there are personal quests in the game that everyone will have two at the start of the game to try and achieve. And these are ways to gain victory points. And so when you achieve them, you reveal them and get to place influence on them and claim that victory point. And so if we were to add hidden roles into the game, I believe my first space that I would design into is create, substituting out the personal quests part of the game and do a deck of, uh, we'll just call them roles for right now, but they would be different uh, jobs or like positions that you can take within the growing city of Everstone. And so instead of giving you a victory point, I would probably position them to be a, I would take the action upgrade cards that are in the game and fuse them with this. And so you are trying to work to get uh, whatever the restricted requirement is. So say the it's to fill your storage with all of the same relic type that could be what the hidden requirement is and once you've achieved that you would get to slot the roll under the top of your I'll switch back it's probably easier because uh, this is going to be more of a talking exercise I will straight stay in the game setup for this one so to recap, what I'm talking about is we have our personal quests, which are secret ways to get victory points in the game, and the action upgrades and would be combining those. So you draw one at the start of the game, and, or draw two and pick one that you're going to be going for for the start of the game. And what would happen on the bottom here is, we'll change colors maybe to... I think purple will probably be pretty easy to see. So you'd still have this bottom. I guess we're still yellow or white. Uh, so you'd take this bottom requirement and combine it with this top bonus. And so once you've achieved this hidden role, you would then get to take this card and upgrade it right into whatever action column you choose. And that could be an ongoing benefit that you get throughout the game uh, as sort of 
you've achieved your hidden roles, so you've achieved your mission within the city of Everstone, which has made you more powerful and becoming more legendary. So I think that would be the first thought I have for designing around hidden roles. Um, a, a second thought that is coming to mind is that you could, these roles would be uh, things that take effect on other players' turns. And so instead of uh, being based around what you're doing, they could be based around what your opponent is doing. And so potentially, as us being the white pawn, when, say, our hidden role allows us to whenever uh, red gets moves up the yellow track, we would get some benefit where, uh, you know, maybe we take something from them or we'd get to go from a card from the market, or we'd, we'd get to take a reactionary action, which uh, is potentially hidden information until that requirement's achieved for the first time. Which, once that would happen, my belief is that, uh, so red, say red moves up, and we're allowed to take our resource from their supply. That would be our hidden role of, you know, as red gain yellow influence, we gain a resource from them. It would cause them to have to pivot and rethink their strategy of, oh, all right, if I want to go up the, the yellow track, I got to understand that I'm going to have a resource taken from me each time. Uh, so it would have to change the path they'd go forward. And maybe they'd decide, okay, you know what? My strategy to win isn't to use the yellow track anymore. Or, oh, sorry, the timer went off. So to recap, we have two ways of potentially adding hidden roles into the, the game of Everstone. The first of which being uh, the combination of the personal quest and the action upgrades, where you have an objective that you need to complete. So for this one, it could be to discover a relic while uh, and sell it while at base camp. And so once you've achieved that, you would get a player power that you'd unlock for the rest of the game for you to take advantage of is the first way we've brainstormed. The second is that you'd be dealt two of these hidden rolls at the beginning of the game that would fire off whenever an opponent does something that you get to take advantage of that. And so as soon as the opponent triggers the effect of your hidden roll for the first time, it would cause that thing that they have to remember for the rest of the game, which would add a different play style to uh, Everstone. So how I would test both of these is that I would probably, instead of using the cards that are imported right now, I would uh, go back and weigh the pros and cons of which one I find to be more within the nature of Everstone that I'm trying to design, and then develop those hidden roll cards for uh, the next round of playtesters to play to get feedback on of, oh, did they like the memory aspect of having to remember what role a player took on? Or did they enjoy the uh, fact that instead of getting ways to sneak out victory points, if they liked a way to unlock a player power too? And be because I've spent a bunch of hours in the development of this, I would probably lean to scrapping both of them just because the attacky nature of those hidden roles isn't within the overall feeling that I'm trying to build within Everstone. And the direct way of uh, the personal quest right now as a focus to enter the game of how to get hidden victory points seems to be a more direct uh, onboarding mechanic for those that are new to the game for something for them to focus on. Whereas a strong power that they might not fully have grasped for how they would like to use the power, uh, I feel like it would create more of a, a barrier to entry points. So I'd probably uh, throw both of them to the side right now. But those would be the two ways that I would add uh, hidden roles into the game of Everstone. So I'm going to check chat to see if there was any questions so far. Uh, nope, it does not appear that anyone has any questions yet. Uh, 
So this is one of the first times I'm publicly showing off Everstone, so feel free to ask any questions about the game that you have if you have them, or as when this video is rewatched, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to move into the last part of today's breakfast. So the last part is the game generator portion. And so we will switch over to let's make a game dot net. And this is their game idea generator. And so what it's going to prompt for us is a genre, a rule, a setting, and a theme for us to, to have a five minute uh, exercise to design a game around. So I'll click the generate button. So we have co-op like, death is the new beginning, science fiction and coming of age is our game prompt. So I'm going to reset the five minute timer and we will see how far we get with this idea. So co-op like is, for those of you who have who've never played co-op, it is a running simulator, I guess, where the QWOMP are all assigned to um, the legs of this hurdler. And so your goal is to hit them in the correct sequence to be able to get across the finish line. And so one part moves, I believe, the quad of the left leg. One letter moves the lower half, like the shin portion of the left leg. And then you have the right quad and right shin as well. And you have these legs that are acting kind of like a newborn calf struggling to walk. And so that is what uh, our genre is. Death being the new beginning uh, makes me think of some sort of phoenix bird rising out of the ashes. So we'll draw a little mole trace really quick. So there's our scribble for the phoenix bird. Uh, <laughs> so we got Michaela in chat saying, death is the new beginning and coming of age seems like heavy themes. <laughs> and she's curious of how we'll design a co-op like board game. So we got science fiction and phoenixes. I, to my knowledge, there's no phoenix that exists in the real world. So we got kind of those matched up and coming of age. And so maybe this game is based on being a phoenix spirit that has to rise out of the ashes. And so, uh, since you have the four parts that you're working with, uh, I'm leaning to this being potentially a card dueling game, where each player has four cards that they're playing out to the board each round. So maybe it isn't locked into a two-player, but they are four movement styles, and the goal of the game is to be the first phoenix to rise from the ashes. And um, so your your com the coming of age is being the, the the phoenix growing up, and without having a deep back history on uh, how the theme of phoenix's work uh, in this design uh, blitz uh, I will say that your goal is to rise up from and take on like the new uh, bird life form and so potentially your goal is to achieve certain certain rungs of Kind of going to ramble for a second to think through, but I believe what we're working towards is trying to be the first to get to the top, your player mark to the top. And so maybe it is a ladder climbing game or some sort of shedding style game where you bring four cards of. I got. Think of the glass road mechanic where everyone probably has the same number of cards. And so potentially it is you're playing four cards per round. And uh, hmm, how do we how 
do we get there? So the goal is to get to the top. And so how do we signify that you've moved forward? Because we're kind of stuck with knowing that because it's co-op like, it's a race and you're confined to four different items. And so maybe these are square. I don't know, because that would be. But you got to play four cards. We know that. We are trying to get to the end. So there's a race. Coming of age. So maybe when you get to each rung, you get to upgrade, or another person gets to upgrade their card uh, to give them a better card in their hand. Uh, we could go with some form of, I believe it's Ian or Tool that creates the card crafting games. So those of you who don't know, I believe it's Ian O'Toole. It's the designer of... I'm going to just look it up real quick so I don't misspeak. But I believe Ian O'Toole was the designer of games like Dead Reckoning and uh, Mystic Veil vale and uh, Custom Heroes. But he has this card crafting mechanic. Sorry, it was John DeClaire. My apologies, John. I did not mean to mix up uh, you and Ian O'Toole. Maybe it uh, was... Why was I thinking Ian O'Toole? I think maybe it's you, the artist. No. I'm just... I'm just not... Uh, I'm in the wrong. <laughs> but uh, John DeClaire has a card crafting style uh, mechanic that he has introduced where you have different segments of the cards and as you you can they're all sleeved and they have transparent um, parts of the card so as you slide them in it upgrades and gives special bonuses to different sections and so potentially we could design around that for or use that mechanic to test um, but I think we we have We'll wrap up with where we got to here, and so maybe in the comments below, uh, as you're watching, if you have ideas of how to move this concept forward, I'd love to engage in uh, that conversation. But where we're at right now is we know that it is a race-style game where you're trying to get to the top of the scoring track. We know that we only have four cards to either play per round or four cards to play permanently. Uh, and we are tying it around the theme of a phoenix being reborn to satisfy the death is the new beginning prompt. And uh, we still have sort of pasted on the coming of age uh, theme of it, but from a, the, the process of going from uh, to a phoenix could kind of be that where we kind of massage the theme into for coming of age. So we still have to figure out what constitutes you to get to move up the track, and we have to figure out what these four cards do. And so I would probably, for uh, moving this concept forward, would take mechanics that are in published games behind me or that I've played before, and uh, I guess top of head, I'm thinking almost like a robo rally or some sort of like these are movement style cards where you want this token that's on the table to end up in front of you at the end of the round. And so each you will go around playing their, your four cards per round to try and get that token to sit in front of you would be the basic structure that I would start for testing this. And so potentially the different segments of these cards have a directional or an ability to um, modify how the movement goes and we would start there and see if that core uh, loop is even fun and we would build off of that as we go but that's sort of where we ended up with this co-op like <laughs> game um, I appreciate everyone for jumping in chat and giving feedback of how we could move the game forward. Uh, 
to recap, if anyone is interested in learning more about Everstone, you can uh, see what I post on my the, my publishing site, or you can even jump into the Discord if you're interested in playing. Uh, we figured out how we might be able to add hidden roles into Everstone, and we <laughs> stumbled through, literally, like co uh, a design of how we would create a co-op style game. So I'm going to end the breakfast there. I appreciate everyone for stopping by. Um, please reach out to me if you have any interest in being part of uh, the board game breakfast or part of Everstone, and I will talk to you all Monday. So have a good one.